it's made by Warner Brothers and it's not intended for like an art house community. But we really looked at it as like we could make an art house film within the box of a studio movie if we kept it small and we kept it intimate and we had an amazing actor like Joaquin. So everything we did was really what can we do to bring the audience inside the mind of Arthur Fleck who becomes Joker. And when you think of something that singular, you know, where there's a lot of scenes with just him in the frame, you know? He spends a lot of time alone and we spend a lot of time with him alone. It does feel a bit like Hamlet or a movie in which you're really looking inside the mind of a person and, uh, and, and that made it not just unique but also made it really fun because suddenly you didn't have to do coverage or deal with a bunch of dialogue. You could really just let the, the frame speak to, the, to his mindset and let things unfold within the camera and an actor singularly and not have to uh, you know, service a lot of people in the frame. Yeah, well, my philosophy on a lot of movies, particularly this one, is that the characters live within their spaces, and those spaces have light, and those spaces have life, and the characters exist within them. So every location we chose and the way we lit them, and really with as much practicals as possible, it was intended to always make um, the, the filmmaking sort of f fall back into the, into the, the background and let us just simply look like we're experience the movie within the reality of this person. It's a unique movie in that he's in every single scene, right? And every character you meet, you meet through his eyes, right? So the whole movie is basically his story and it's really truly his story being told by him. Well, what happens if that character is unreliable? Is that you don't know, is this part real? Is this part not real? Is this part a fantasy? Is this part a, a retelling of something that happened and so that's a big part of the movie and 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 so I think it's up for the audience to interpret which parts they think may or may not be real. Taxi Driver was more a memory of ours right and of course it's a disaffected loner who strikes back at society right and in his own has his own motivation so there are tonal things about the movie and certainly the story that remind you of Taxi Driver and of course because De Niro's in it it can even remind you of you know, uh, other movies of his, like King of Comedy. But strangely, we never really looked at Taxi Driver. In fact, I never saw, ta I had seen Taxi Driver, of course, in my youth, but when I, uh, I first saw Taxi Driver again from beginning to end, uh, maybe last month, I did this uh, like, uh, screening with Michael Chapman and we talked about Taxi Driver. And it was the first time I had seen it in 10 years. And uh, so the influence of Taxi Driver on Joker are perhaps less than people might suspect. And the, the way it influenced the movie was more the me my memory of what Taxi Driver was, right? It's like I remembered it, but I didn't really reference it distinctly because we weren't setting out to make a movie that looked like Taxi Driver. We weren't setting out to make a movie that looked like a 70s movie in like that we were replicating that look. But we wanted it to feel like the way those movies, as if it could have been made at that time, if you know what I mean. Like, so handmade, singular characters, right? Like they made movies about one character back then, right? Two characters at most, Midnight Cowboy, uh, you know, Dog Day Afternoon. You know, these movies that were singular in their sort of character studies. And in that regard, we were referencing those movies, but not from a look standpoint. The only thing from a look standpoint I was, I was trying to replicate was a little bit of just what the film stock looked like and it was even a slightly more modern stock it was 5293 in which I I spent a lot of time trying to create a LUT that would replicate the curve of 5293 and and so in that regard I was trying to sort of make sure it felt very cinematic and film like e organic and chemical even though <clears throat> we were shooting digital so that was the most I was sort of referencing that time of, of, of movie making So, so we were going to shoot 35 all the way until the very last minute and then we started realizing I think that the movie was going to be a bit more improvisational at times than, than we suspected because of Joaquin and the whole thing was how do we make sure every time Joaquin is performing we give him the most 
opportunities for success. We knew we weren't going to do a lot of takes, and so we would only maybe have one chance, and we wanted to shoot it very naturally. And, and all those things, I think, drew us to the, the things that sometimes shooting digital can provide technically, right? Which is, we, you know focus is going to be good. It's, if it's bad, you know right away. You're not going to get any surprises the next day. Um, all these things, right? We could shoot without rehearsals or marks and, and be okay with the technical things and not have to worry about um, censoring ourselves in a way or like to, to not be as courageous as we want it to be. I could literally pick up a camera with no rehearsals and just start shooting and I wasn't concerned that like we would have technical problems. So that drew us to digital and Todd, we very much liked film and the film look, right? Which has certain things when we were able to compare them literally side by side because we had tested them. The richness of the blacks. There's never a clean white, right? There's cyan in the highlights. There's sometimes yellow in the low lights. And so we had to introduce those into a lot. And my color scientist uh, who does my color correction is a woman named Jill Bogdanovich and her, her, her father actually worked at Kodak and he helped develop 5293 and stocks of that time. So he actually went in and created, helped me create a LUT that would replicate 5293 as best as possible. So it had all those things. It had a little bit of that cyan, a little bit of that yellow in the bottom end. It had the, the curve that would, that would really replicate it. So we really didn't do much from the dailies to the final because I lit to that LUT. It was only one LUT for the whole movie and I could just light it like I was shooting film but obviously see it in real time. So, um, and, and almost instantly, even from the makeup and hair test, which is actually, we released it online as like the first teaser trailer. That makeup hair test, even through the lens, we could see something that felt very much like chemistry. It felt like film, you know, as opposed to a digital look, you know. My relationship with Todd has, is, is always about us pushing each other further every single time we make a movie, right? So from the first movie we did together, which was The Hangover and had great success, we never wanted to sort of choose to be conservative. Every time we chose to then make a movie, we always explicitly said to each other, let's keep pushing ourselves, let's keep taking chances, let's go darker than a comedy usually is, let's continue to sort of stretch and, and do things. And because of that, I know how much flexibility Todd likes in making movies. And I like it too, so I know that we can prepare, I can have all kinds of ideas about what I want to do with shadow and light, I can have ideas of exactly what lens I want to be on, and sometimes we come in and he throws it all away, and he says, this is what we're going to do, we're going to do something completely different than what we thought, all the shots we thought we need, we're not going to do, and, uh, and so I always have to be prepared to throw everything away, but still put the ideas that we had into the final product. So the preparation actually provides that flexibility. Or like, uh, for instance, after the subway killings, he runs down that underneath the bridge and he goes into a small bathroom. Uh, and in, in, the, in the script, he was going to hide the gun in this little grate underneath the bathroom. He was gonna wash off his makeup and he was gonna look inside the mirror and he was gonna say, do you like to laugh? That was like literally how it was written. And uh, we came to set that day, and, and this was early enough in the movie that it really informed future th decisions in the movie. And Todd's like, yeah, I don't think we're going to do that. I think we're just going to play some music and let Joaquin express it non-verbally, right? And so our great uh, camera operator, who is Jeff Haley, who's one of the best in the world, and he's worked with us for a long time, uh, we didn't tell him anything, just bought, put him in the room handheld. He stood there and the door opened. Joaquin put his, his back against the wall and Todd played a bit of music from Hilder and, uh, and we just let it happen. So we shot, we, it, you know, it was on stage, so we had, I could light it for 360 and, uh, and that first take is really much of what's in the movie, which is just feeling this dance between the camera operator, the environment and the light and Joaquin and the music and just followed down to his feet. And just, it, that first time we saw it was the first time we saw it. There was, we, there was no rehearsal, it was just that. And then we started doing that a lot throughout the movie where we would intentionally not want to know what happened. I was operating B camera. So me and Jeff would often just watch each other and sort of dance each other so we wouldn't get in each other's shots. And, uh, and we would just sort of express 
the camera with Joaquin in real time, and uh, it was thrilling. You know? So after that scene in the bathroom, which was early enough that it was really helpful because we kind of, one of the things I learned with Todd is that you sort of discover the movie you're making as you're making it, right? You have a plan, you have all these things, but you really you're not making the movie. You're making the movie every day, and you're changing the movie every day. And because that music experience with the bathroom, often, like you talked about the corridors, walking up the stairs, these sort of nonverbal expressions of his daily life, we would often play Hilder's music. And Hilder's music has a rhythm and a pace that could inform the speed of the camera move, or even the speed of the pan, or the, the rhythm of, of Joaquin walking down this, the, the hallway. That rhythm comes from the music. If it was a faster pace, that would come from that. And, and we would often play music for other scenes that would then express the rhythm of the scene too, right? Some of the things that are actually in the movie, um, dancing on the steps, you know, that, that song that's in the movie, that we knew that song was going to be in the movie, and so we played it while he danced. And, and some of the other things, when he's preparing his green hair in the bathroom and dancing in his underwear, we knew that music. And we shot other scenes too that just were all about music and rhythm, and, and they were really sort of fun to do. There was, a, there was definitely a method to the madness, uh, and sometimes it wasn't very overt and sometimes a bit more, but you know, the early scenes are intended to be a little bit more distant from him, longer lenses, see him within his world, almost invisible, uh, so put him within people, framed very long lens between people, lots of people around him, and he's just one small piece of this like, bigger world um, in a bit more full light. The, the movie is a little bit about two sides of ourselves, the sort of light and the shadow. And so as he progressively embraces his shadow side, his darker side, we did that with the lighting as well. Uh, and with the framing, we progressively got closer and closer and more intimate and more within his mind as we progressed along the story. And with the lighting, we started darkening things, putting him almost, creating him as a shadow. Uh, an example would be his transition to Joker begins with a very violent act on a subway against three men that are attacking him. Um, and literally the scene that follows that, we see him running through under a bridge and the shadow, his shadow precedes him. It's like his shadow is drawing him to this new person that he will become. So it's like calling him to say, this is your future, your shadow is your future and I'm going to take you there. So even we went as far as to do things like that. The whole subway killing was a challenge, right? Because I know Todd really wanted that scene to feel like a fever dream and to feel like it had this almost confusing sort of cacophony of light and, uh, and working out how we would technically accomplish that, which we ended up doing on stage with LED panels outside the windows. What we ended up doing was literally shooting stills of subway platforms right because a motion picture is 24 stills a second right and we created these like huge panoramas that we could put on a timeline and then you could literally like push the button and the 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 panel would go across the led panel so it looked like a subway station going by and then we shot elements of like fluorescence like the one that's over your camera and so i'd have a whole section of just fluorescent lights and then i have a section of just warm tungsten bulbs and then i have a, another subway station that was like cooler light and I could see all those layers on a, on a timeline and I was on the lighting board and in real time I could like watch the scene and control those lights flashing on and off. I could control what was passing by in the outside, whether it was another subway station or a bunch of lights. I'm very happy with the way that turned out because it was challenging, it, it, it involved a lot of technical things. It was a good example of like what I love about cinematography and being a cinematographer is the combination of both art and technique and art and technical things, and so the, the solution to that scene, I'm very happy with the way it, it, it was executed to give the scene this sort of weird, strange, but including all the light that uh, I think helped get us to this point that's a very dramatic and important part of the movie.
It's the most violent the movie has gotten. It's the most violent the movie is through the end. Um, and you know it's going to happen, right? He grabs some scissors. It's like, and that, the big thing there for me, from let's say a lighting and a camera work standpoint, we knew we were going to do it sort of handheld for the sort of um, uh, the, the visceral and sort of immediacy that that could bring. But it was the idea that it's transitioning to afternoon, right? And even though there's no sh sunlight, the, the light there is supposed to be a bit violent in its way, right? So the, all the light coming through those windows, which is really the only thing providing the light in the scene, it's a little silhouetted in the same idea of keeping him in the shadow in this transition, uh, is that it's fighting its way into the room in a violent way, like it's splattering on the walls, almost like the blood that's about to come. And it's, it, the light itself is sort of preempting the violence that's about to happen. It's like, it's fighting its way into the room in a way that it, we haven't seen it really do that in the movie. Um, so that was one of the big parts of it. But yeah, it's a very violent scene. <laughs> it's a very violent scene with a lot of blood. The beautiful thing about shooting large format, we shot on Aries 65. It was one of the real reasons we decided to shoot digitally was so that we could shoot with that camera, um, is that you have the ability to be quite close to the actors. And psychologically, I love the effect that that has to draw the audience in because we really feel our proximity and our, our closeness to, to the actor, but you're not on like a w super wide lens. So you have the ability to be a little bit more of a medium lens, even sometimes a longer lens, but have his world present in there. So he's part of his world, but the world falls off into, into uh, softness because of the lack of depth of field. So it has this beautiful three dimensional quality in camera, you know? I, I love that camera. I shot Godzilla on that camera. Uh, although we shot that anamorphic, but we still use the larger sensor, so it was like double anamorphic. In this, we shot flat on purpose, 185, really exploiting those that that format of the. It's almost like uh, we we, you know, we wanted to sort of have the most intimacy we could with the actor, and I think those lenses really provided that. We used basically, I, I call it a Frankenstein set of lenses, uh, because. I had different criteria, right? So I set out, once I decided we were gonna shoot uh, Alexa 65, I knew I needed large format lenses that would cover the sensor. And so we used, we had like 13 primes. Maybe we used four hero lenses, right? The 58, the 80 DNA, this 135 that was quite beautiful, this 280 Leica that was awesome, and this 350 that was quite quite beautiful as well. Um, I think it was a Canon 350. and. Uh, but it was a mixture. So it had, we had some old Canon. They were all vintage glass of the 70s. So it was like some Canon, some Zeiss, uh, the DNAs, three, I think three DNAs in our set, uh, two signature, airy signature lenses, um, and a couple Leicas. So it was literally like a bunch of manufacturers all serving the purposes that I needed for the movie, which was close focus, which was a big issue. And sometimes the DNA weren't close focus enough. Um, speed, so like I would have two 50s. I had one that was a 1.3 in case I needed very wide open and very low light, but I also had one that was better quality at a 2.8. Uh, and I had the same thing I think on a, uh, a 35, two 35s that were also like that, one faster and one, uh, uh, one that was better quality. So it was basically, I, I manufactured a set of lenses for the movie to fit the needs that I had for the movie, basically. It wasn't about matching. It wasn't about, because I also wanted it to feel like the movie was a bit handmade. So all the imperfections and the inconsistencies were part of like the texture of the movie. So I wasn't looking for cleanliness. You know, I wasn't looking for perfection in the lenses. And the, the final shot, which is one of my favorite shots in the movie, which is this like close up that's about this big on, is that minimum focus on that 350. And it's, uh, it was right at a 5.6, which at that lens, literally, it's like there's nothing there. But, but it, it still had contrast at that, at that stop, and it's, I love it. I love, that. I love that shot. It's the closest we are in the whole movie to him, and it's beautiful. And it's in that like, white light. It's totally different color than the rest of the movie. I think, you know, in large part, it's a meditative look inside the mind of a human being. And so because of that, I, I think one of the things I really tried to do was create singular frames. To create frames, you know, the movie doesn't have a lot of 
fast camera movement. If the camera moves, it moves quite deliberately and quite slowly. It has a lot of static shots. It has some handheld, but very quiet, very simple handheld. So in every opportunity, I was really looking for chances to say, if you pause this image at any moment with no dialogue, maybe a bit of music, what story could it tell? Could it story, tell a story of loneliness? Could it tell a story of madness? And so in every scene, I was just trying to find images that could resonate in their, on their own without you know, needing any dialogue. And, but also to do it in as natural a way as possible. I was never trying to be overt with the lighting, although I had my reasons, like we talked about with the shadows. And, but I, I was hoping all of that would feel very subtle and, and subconscious to the audience, but never, never stylistic or very just a simple told story with images that, uh, that were engaging and maybe at times even artful for a movie that is on its surface a comic book movie, right? So it's hard to like create, you know, you don't know if, often have opportunities to create something that can feel like an old 70s movie or an art house film but on the landscape of a, of a big Warner Brothers movie.